Good evening, everybody. My name is Sonia Reines Givenides. I'm the executive director of the European Peacebuilding Liaison Office. We're a network of uh, 50 organizations in Europe working in conflict prevention and peacebuilding uh, all around the world. It's wonderful to be back at the Basel Peace Forum, which I think that at the beginning it was noted as an inspirational expertise filled place where we're going to embrace complexity and figure out how to do better in the city of peace. So I can't think of a better place to spend the evening tonight and with amazing panelists, uh, both online and here on stage with me. The format of this is that we're going to um, have a, an interactive discussion after we hear from our panelists. And we're going to try and have a couple of rounds. It's a very large topic, as Pamela and I were just discussing in the break. So we'll see just how far and how deep we can get. Uh, and then what it leads to next. So let me briefly introduce the panelists um, in uh, the order in which they will be speaking. I'll try this to do my best. We've got Patricia Danzi, who's Director General of the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation. Your bio is extensive, your experience is impressive. Um, you've spent a lot of time in Africa and over 20 years with the ICRC, so you will inevitably have a tremendous amount of expertise for this particular panel. Dr. Peter Wagner, head of the Service for Foreign Policy Instruments at the European Commission. You've had a notable uh, career within the Commission. Uh, before that, you were head of the support group for Ukraine. And uh, I always like to mention this when I mention you, because I think it's quite interesting that you have a PhD in not only political science, but history and psychology. And the confluence of the three is uh, inevitably helpful for you in this line of work, Peter. <laughs> Um, Pamela Fav is a psychologist who's worked with victims of enforced disappearance. Your experience has been in El Salvador with a number of different NGOs, and uh, particularly with the El Salvador's Ombudsman's Office with victims of enforced displacement and other serious human rights violations. We're really glad that you could join us here today, Pamela. And online, and maybe beamed up above us, which seems like a good place for Professor Dr. Jan Kilzan, the director there he is, uh, of the Institute for Transcultural Health Science at the Cooperation State University of Baden-Württemberg, and a whole bunch of other things, including uh, working for more than 20 years with war-traumatized people in Germany and abroad. And so we've got a whole range of different panelists from, you know, I think we, we're going to cover both the medical all the way through to the policy arena in this particular panel. Speaking of the panel, where are we? Healing the past and transforming the future. The panel addresses the psychosocial dimensions of transitional justice, including the specific issue of missing persons cases, exploring the intersection of trauma, grief, and the potential for healing. The experts will focus on the profound emotional toll and psychological consequences associated with violent conflict and the absence of loved ones, and discuss also the potential strategies from a legal, political, and psychological perspective. I want to thank uh, Swiss Peace, one of our founding members, for having the idea to have this particular panel today. Coming over, um, I was flicking through The Economist reading and there were no shortage of articles on this. You had an article on Ukraine and the dealing with traumatized soldiers. You had an article about Cambodia and the legacy still of the war and, and the consequences on the economics and on the people that suffered. And you had another article um, about the legacy in Northern Ireland. So we know in the midst of places where we are now, the issue of trauma and how it's dealt with and how do you move forward and cycle out of conflict is something that we all have to deal with. And we have to figure out how to do better. We have, as uh, one of the panelists said on the previous panel, a high responsibility. So with that, I wanted to uh, open the panel. Patricia, um, can I start with you? And if we're OK on a first name basis, uh, the recognition of the issue of trauma and conflict in its aftermath, as I was just saying, is, is sadly higher than ever. From your vantage point, what does it take to really raise this at, in a political level? So it's not just something that's an add-on or a side thing or a project that somewhere in some ministry is funding, uh, perhaps through a local embassy, but something that's really taken into consideration elsewhere. Sounds like we've got some kitchen mess behind us, but stay with <laughs> us. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me. I think what, it, what helps is if you personally have some experience with it, either directly or in your personal experience in your work. In my case, um, the psychosocial drama of, of war and its impact 
it had on uh, what it has on societies was following me since my birth. I was born during the Biafra war, but in Switzerland. Um, but my family was following that and it followed me afterwards. Then in my very early career, as a young you mentioned, uh, my career as, a, as an ICRC, International Committee of the Red Cross Delegate, I was 27, more or less, and I had to all of a sudden deal with the trauma of the people that lost uh, in uh, Srebrenica and Goraš, the, the loved ones, and were having um, multiple losses uh, in in very short period of time. And then you start wondering what can you do to not only help the people, but how can you actually help preventing so much stress on on different level and and um, one. One topic that we're addressing today is the peace and the process it leads to. I have um, seen that when into peace processes, the impact of the psychosocial um, impact it had on people during the war is embedded. That meaning it's addressed and it's okay to address it. It has a, a potential to be built in, um, into law it can be enshrined into um, not necessarily law, but into budget lines for the ones that survived it, for the so centers that support them. So it is something that the state takes the responsibility on, or the community takes the responsibility on. The higher, the better. And recently, I was traveling to, to Ukraine a couple of uh, weeks ago. I, I saw in one of the cities in Lviv, that uh, the mayor of the city was actually um, himself uh, a, a medical doctor, psychologist, and he wanted his community during the war already address it with the tough guys, with the soldiers, so that it was okay, even if you're tough, to have um, uh, and to seek support, and it was kind of mandatory to, to seek it. So built it in uh, and put the money uh, after a peace agreement into this, uh, into this uh, topic as well. Because very often the attention drifts and uh, building it takes very, very long time. You mentioned the missing. This is years and years. Uh, the healing uh, of, the, of, the, of the communities takes so long. Um, uh, it's always an issue to get the funds and the attention uh, on the long term. I also uh, want like to mention, and then I, I, I don't want to monopolize it, women take a huge role in this. Very often, they drive policy change. They demonstrate in front of offices, UN offices or government offices, uh, and they ask for uh, either recognition of uh, what they're going through when they're not having their loved ones back, or the fight for the family members uh, to include this uh, suffering into a political attention. And I've seen the abuelas de Argentina, uh, we have the, in, in Bosnia, we have this, we have it uh, today in Ukraine, even in Russia. Uh, it is an issue that women can, can drive, and they often do, and they join forces uh, alongside, from one side to the other, they are the first ones to recognize um, that the suffering is the same on both sides, and they build bridges also in that sense. So, sorry, it was a bit long. It was perfect, and you can tell why you are where you are, because if you've got someone with your experience, you naturally have a kind of credibility to be able to speak to people. I love how you came out with um, building it in and putting, uh, putting in the money, coming to you in a second on that one, Peter. But um, also, I really, uh, when you said in the role of women, I thought you were going to go down a different track. And I'm so pleased that what you highlighted first and foremost was women's role in driving policy change and not the bazillions of other things that we could have gone down. So thank you for that, for that opening. Um, Peter, could you tell us a little bit more about what the European Union is doing on this with 144 delegations and offices worldwide and some 35, 34, somewhere around there, 1,000 civil servants, the impact is potentially really huge. And, and your, uh, the work of your uh, service in conflict prevention, peace building, crisis is definitely um, 
got a lot to say about this. And I'm really quite curious to, to hear from you. Your time, uh, like that of all the panelists, is really valuable, but you've come here today, so this must be of particular importance. Over to you, Peter. No, thank you very much. And indeed, it's of importance in the sense of it's the first time that we as FPI are here in a more institutional manner trying to find out because we hear, have the impression that here, also on this topic, we find a community with new ideas, people with whom to exchange. And that's why I uh, took the early train on the French side, fortunately, uh, from Brussels. Um, a, a few things, because as FPI, as a service, and if you take a wider definition of the topic, we've been doing a lot of things over a pretty long time already. And we looked before that meeting at a map which my colleagues had prepared, which shows that we are doing it on different continents and, and, and in, if you look into the details in many different ways. Now, I'd like to talk, of, first of all, about what we are doing when it comes to the immediate impact and the immediate uh, effects, um, the needs of the victims, where unfortunately we have very acute examples there where we are uh, present, uh, to mention a few. It's Afghanistan, uh, Ukraine, uh, Gaza, Israel, where we had in the last few years and months started actions and are about to build up bigger actions. For us, that is really then very wide. That was in the first days of the full-scale uh, Russian invasion in Ukraine. Very targeted measures on uh, females, female refugees and their children. It was support to later on uh, the uh, investigators because it has a lot to do with transitional justice. It's, it's a much wider understanding for us where we are contributing. It's a lot um, that then came in on the kind of mental health um, of, again, at the beginning, very much women, IDPs, uh, children. Now, what was, however, very clear from the beginning is that, and I stay with Ukraine at the moment, because there we are a bit further advanced, it, the scaling up is a big challenge. And that's the second part where I want to talk about where we are, I don't want to say struggling, but where we are, of course, still looking for inspiration. There are so many possibilities to deal with a topic. You have to adapt them to the society, and you somehow, somehow have to choose. Where do you start with? In Ukraine, for example, we decided to try and go for a package now where we address veterans and their families as a group, but try to look at it in a bottom-up manner, how to also reintegrate them socially, economically, into their communities. So to have the wider package, uh, not only mental health, but also anything that comes with it and around it. Um, similarly, we are at the moment, and we started that uh, work at the end of last year, um, Gaza uh, and Israel, we are about to put packages together on both sides. How can we work on psychosocial support? At the moment, it's really the most immediate effects, supporting organizations that are there, going in, supporting those which are already there. But for sure, there as well, the question of the bigger package uh, will come. Now, what is very present in our discussions is the dimension that you referred to, and that is the long term dimension. This is something that is with the people for decades. And uh, you came with your personal experience. My personal experience is I'm the son of a refugee who had to flee from his home at the result of the Second World War. Now, I was more than 20 to understand that and to understand that a lot of things which were happening in my families and other families in the region was the impact of still unsolved mental issues from the war situation and that we have across Europe. And that generation is to some degree still alive. So it's very important also here to think on the long term where we are looking for solutions, where we are trying to, 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 to um, make it part of our wider crisis packages. And that is a little bit to come to the examples. We've been working in the Great Lakes region. We've been uh, working in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Burundi, Rwanda, also over time. And it's quite rewarding then when the people from Rwanda, some of them are coming back now, soon having their 30th year of the uh, genocide, and still working on it and say, can we still have a continuation? of it, can we come back to this? So that is something that we find uh, very important, and you have to always look at it. Is it ethnic? Is it whatever? Uh, what, is at, what is the root cause? So that is what we are doing, and the final word of the thinking that we have at the moment, that is colleagues have started a bit the work of putting together a kind of a guide for all our colleagues in the field. 
from our side alone, we have about 100 of our colleagues worldwide, part of the delegations, um, the, the embassies of the EU, but we also have many other partners. And that's where we are trying, thinking about what can we put together as a useful guide for them to start from, so that then in a more informed manner we can start looking for the experts with whom we're trying to um, work on this. And in all of that, uh, you referred to us being the money of the EU to some degree. We have facilities in place um, on uh, justice in conflict and transition, and there we have already a roster of experts and we can use <coughs> some of that. But it's definitely a topic where we are looking where within the not growing uh, financial means available, we can find the most efficient way of using those funds. Peter, thank you. It's great to hear that the European Union is looking into providing this kind of um, guidelines uh, about how to do the work better because there isn't more money. So it's a question of using what you have in a better way. And it's great to see the FPI is in the lead on this. There has always been in, within uh, uh, the foreign policy instrument an expertise in, in these contexts and this kind of work. So to try to then make it become doing the sensitization for other colleagues across the board seems really uh, time well spent. Um, Pamela, you and I had the uh, opportunity to speak uh, before the panel, and I was really Im impressed by the kind of work that you've been doing in El Salvador, but also it's a context that we don't think about as much, those of us who are more focused on, on other conflicts. And you reminded us all of why, uh, or you will about to remind everybody, you will remind everybody about why it is that we can't forget El Salvador. Can you tell us a little bit about the work that you've been doing there, um, and in particular, your focus on, on missing children? Yes, uh, El Salvador is a tiny country in Central America, and the Civil War ended 32 years ago. However, there are still issues that are unresolved, mainly in psychosocial point of view, and uh, we have a lot of disappeared children, disappeared adults during the war. And I think that it's very important to have this kind of discussions uh, so early in some conflicts that are now happening, because as, how I say, as, how, as I was saying, 32 years ago in El Salvador, the war ended, and we still have families looking for their missing. We still have families that haven't resolved uh, any of the psychosocial issues. We, don't, we haven't had any processes, judicial processes, or any state uh, intervention to solve many of the issues that the war left. Um, I think that in El Salvador, as well as in Argentina, we can see that even if 30, 40 years ago have passed, we can see that families are still looking for their disappeared children, like Abuela de Plaza de Mayo, like Asociación Pro Búsqueda in El Salvador, that's the NGO I worked with. And we looked for disappeared children that were either snatched from uh, conflict zones uh, by military or by other actors in El Salvador, or uh, other children that were given up for adoption by course in their families. So uh, we've worked mainly in the psychosocial team to address uh, the impact of the disappearance of the loss of these children. And we, have, we had come to see that it, families cannot start grieving the loss of a missing person because they don't have any answers, they don't have any certainty either of or their life or of their death. So this loss is not completed this loss is ambiguous, as we, we call it. And these families, uh, like Patricia was saying, decades after, we, you have this very real pain in, in each of the family members, this uh, loss of their, their, their child, their spouse, or their family member in general. And I think that one of the lessons learned in the work, in the psychosocial work we did with all the victims, is that for now, uh, with a missing person, the pain doesn't disappear. However, it may be transformed, but we've seen that it's mainly possible in collective processes, mm -hmm. uh, in strengthening the communities, in strengthening the social fabric, 
and this disap these disappearances made uh, from the state or other actors have as an objective also to destruct this social fabric, to affect the communities, to uh, dislodge them, and that is why it's important and in Latin America and in El Salvador we've seen that working in this community is uh, strengthening what, what was lost. We've seen that uh, victims that are in communities where other members of this community lost their family members, they show more resilience than other people that are more isolated, that they do not share their experience with other members of the community and that can understand their pain. So uh, other of the lessons learned, I think, is that as a psychologist, uh, we mainly guided the discussions, we accompanied the process, but we didn't have the answers. Uh, I think that the best equipped people <coughs> to hear about this kind of impacts are the other people that, that went through these experiences. So that's why we were only there to guide the process. And this support between peers was mostly important. I think that in, in the actual context where we have new conflicts, where we have also missing children, disappeared children, and adults as well, uh, it's very hopeful to know that these topics are being talked about. Because in the 80s, in the 90s, we didn't have maybe the tools or the sharing of experiences that we may have now. And it's important to take into account all these lessons learned, all the challenges that other organizations uh, in other parts of the world have come through uh, to, to act as soon as possible in this, in this country, in these conflict zones. Because uh, as I was telling at the beginning, 32 years have passed and we still can see that the pain is, is there. And since we haven't had any transitional justice processes, uh, we can see that this lack of response of the state is double affecting the victims. It's like re-victimizing. Re um, however, the communities have organized some kind of uh, tribunals that uh, every victim can be heard of, and they expose their experiences. And we've seen that even if we don't have this criminal justice process, like this uh, official criminal justice, the sharing and the listening and the validating of this pain is very important for, for the victims, at least in this context. Each context, context is different, of course, but uh, it would be good to take into account this kind of processes when the state is not willing to offer this space of criminal justice or truth-seeking. Thanks, Pamela. I think there's a few things that, that come out immediately. I mean, you speak profoundly about the pain and what that, that means in these contexts. Um, the collective processes, guiding a process but not knowing the answer. I think that's really something that we should sit with for a little while. Um, and I'd be interested in your take about caring for the, care caring for the caretakers uh, in this instance. Uh, I'd be quite interested in that. And also you, tra you brought us through how mental health and psychosocial support or tra transitional justice, um, how it's working with the absence of uh, a, a perfect process and how it might be used in different places. So um, it's not all particularly evident and I look forward to hearing more from you about that. Uh, Jan, beaming from above us, um, moving from El Salvador to Iraq, I'd be curious to hear a little bit more um, from your experiences, you, which are a lot, but what are some of the examples? What are some of the ways in which we can learn um, from what's been done in your areas of work that might be applicable today uh, in other contexts and still in the ones in which you're working. So none of these things are closed, it's taking decades. And also, um, particularly your experiences at the community level. I hear there's a lag between you and us, it's all normal, everybody, so we'll just... <laughs> 
Thank you very much for the invitation and I appreciate the opportunity to be with you. Maybe I uh, should give an example of uh, uh, genocide against the Yazidis was started in 2014 by my ex. Uh, they killed more than 10,000 people uh, and enslaved and raped women systematically and so we call it a it's a general attack, but it's indeed a general attack. But um, this is not the first time that happened in the Middle East. This is also faced by uh, Orthodox Christians, by uh, Mandias, by Alevis, by Fahis, by Baha'is. So it's still something that has happened, uh, which means uh, they dehumanize different kinds of acts, like in Yugoslavia and Rwanda or against the Yazidi in Iraq and Syria and now in Ukraine is something that shows us how truly human beings can be. And as a result, we see by the Yazidis, by, by the Christian, but also another minority, uh, the technology that they get into is very important. So we are talking uh, the Western point of genocide or massacre or something of war always individual someone uh, suffered someone uh, suffered a trauma infant or suffered some another psychological symptoms but what is happened if a genocide is a small group minority it's faced not one generation what faced a trauma or massacre like the Yazidis and the narratives they mentioned, they face now in the last 800 years, 74 genocides. Just imagine what has happened from one generation to the next generation. So as a psychologist and psychotherapist and trauma expert, we're talking about individual, individual trauma, but like the Yazidis in, on 3 August 2014, target by IS was the aim to destroy this group. So it's an act of genocide and it's mean, it's a collective trauma. It's not just to take one or two person or mm, to kill someone. The aim was to kill all the Yazidis or convert them by force to Islam. So this is the second type that's very important for uh, psychosocial support or psychosocial or psychotherapy. The second is a transgeneration trauma. So we are talking about three different kinds of trauma. It's not only one. We're talking about individual trauma, which all persons suffer from their own pain and trauma even. We are talking about a collective trauma because the, all the community was suffered from this trauma. So it's a collective trauma. And we have the historical trauma that by the ancestor who is transfer from one generation to next generation. It's called also intergeneration trauma. Or it's a transmission of trauma. So it's something that happened 800 years. If you take uh, the German massacre in Namibia, for example, it's what has happened with the next generation. So it's, uh, I have, I want to actually, two aspects are very necessary for me. One is that transgeneration uh, traumata, the collective individual traumata. But through my, my observance and research, we see also the kind of justice or injustice should be also taken into account, not in the perspective of a legal uh, issue to take them to ICC or elsewhere. Uh, psychotherapy, we, if we talk to the Yazidis or to the Christians, they have to believe the world is unfair there is a kind of injustice, and this makes an impact on the society. Even in our research, in another research, we can see there is a kind of epigenetic of trauma, which means 300 years, 400 years ago, if there's any genocide, the next generation is impacted by mental health and physical health. And this should be also taken into account. And if we started with MHPSS programs, intervention programs, and support them, like in Ukraine now. We have to work long term to support people in a way of society, economic, and psychosocial work, but take all this free. The past is never over. If we try to heal the past, we have to understand what was happened in the past, even not 
to an individual person, also to the ancestors, the family, and the community. And I mean, this is something that we have maybe discussed more deeper. And in the next step, uh, what is the best evidence-based psychosocial support? What is the best evidence-based psychotherapy to be more effectful? Otherwise, if we are not doing anything or short time, like NGOs is doing in Iraq and Syria and other countries, which they are doing amazing work. There's not discussion about them. But if we are don't do this very long term, like child soldiers, uh, I can guarantee you we will have the next generation of terrorists or you will radicalize the society like we can see in Gaza or another country. So it is very important to start it now to support the people for long term, maybe with, with a professional help from Europe. But the most important issue is we need more local experts, more professional psychotherapists, social workers, uh, psychiatrists to uh, treat their own people, their own language and their own background of the culture, which means transcultural psychiatry, to adapt the Western modern idea of psychosocial methods and psychotherapy is all time always not working so we have to change and adapt and the next way the people will be able to support themselves as a kind of sustainability thank you Jan, I think you make a very compelling uh, argument for why we need to support this work more uh, and the extent of the trauma uh, across generations and individual and collective. You ended on, on, on local uh, and needing to support more local experts. I think the, um, one of the reasons it's wonderful, wonderful to have you, Patricia, is that the Swiss government has been working in this area, I think, since the 1990s. And they have uh, their own lessons learned. I'd be very interested if you could tell us more about, about the work that the Swiss government has been doing in this, and perhaps in the Great Lakes, but anywhere you'd like, really. And um, I also want to open up to panelists to be able to ask each other questions. I feel like I'm totally dominating. So within that, Patricia, if you want to float a question back to, uh, to Peter, to Jan, to Pamela, um, and or to the audience, I think this can be an exchange in both ways, then, then please do. And uh, for the audience, please do get your I can't see any of you, you're all in the dark, but please do get your questions ready because then they'll lift the lights and pass the mics um, so we can take advantage of the Q&A. Pamela. P Patricia. Okay. Pa Patricia, Pamela. <laughs> okay. 6.45, 7 o'clock for a panel. Maybe no, just the on, on some of the things that, um, that, that some of you said that resonated uh, with me, uh, in terms of what can be done and what we are trying to do. Uh, you take the Great Lakes, you take Ukraine, you take the Near East, you actually name it. What we often forget, uh, and um, Salvador uh, is, uh, is an example for this, we talk about wars, but there is also violence. And um, many, many of the communities uh, that we work in, that we work with, are not necessarily affected by wars. So the attention they get is less, but the trauma um, and the, also the disasters that are left behind, the missing people, the injured, the, the, the threats, it's the same thing. And I think there we have to always uh, take care that we don't lose these people because the, the, the impact afterwards can be very, very similar. And um, you talked about collective and individual trauma. Uh, and there we have a dilemma when we talk about local. We very much uh, are convinced that if you want to address it, you need local um, psychologists, local people that can actually address it. However, if they were part of the trauma, uh, it is very difficult for a society to talk to each other if we have all lived through the same thing. So it's kind of normal. And if I complain to you, say, why are you complaining? I had the same thing. So it is a dilemma to bring the local expertise from outside to talk to the community in their language for them to open up and to start the healing while um, having enough people that are not affected or have healed already from, from that trauma. And another um, issue maybe is the rituals. Uh, you alluded to this a bit. It's very important to have a closure for the healing um, in the terms of, of missing, even if you don't find the remains, uh, the mortal remains, you still can stage a burial if you have the information so that you can actually 
bury uh, your grief with the person. Mm -hmm. And uh, these kind of, of work, it costs not a lot of money. It's maybe not something we think about first, but what we definitely need to do is to listen. What is it actually that people want? They want, sometimes they want really justice because it was injustice was done and it's part of the healing. Sometimes they want to be listened to and sometimes they want the closure. So, and also within the community, it's not that everyone wants the same thing. Uh, and I think there the, 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 the nuance of, of, of us coming um, and the ability to, to make this nuance and to listen is a, is a very important thing. And then the other thing is to understand what to do if we are in, in, in front of it. Uh, some of our partners, for instance, in Afghanistan tell us, you know, we go to the local government and then the governor starts the meeting with saying, when I was in Guantanamo, so you kind of know that it may be difficult now. So what do you, what do you say uh, as, as, uh, as a person to a to a person that you know went through it and he says it. So he wants a reaction. So do you say, I'm sorry, um, how are you? It, it's, it's good to have a tool set in terms of what do you do? Uh, and uh, there we still have a, lo a, long, way, a long way to go. Um, and if you've got anything for any of your fellow colleagues, but uh, on that one, I think also you pointed to an issue that's evolved a lot over time. If we're learning more on this issue, we're also learning that it's not peace or justice or peace versus justice, and that what justice or peace mean to anybody should be asked to those individuals in those contexts. Mm -hmm. And that in fact, uh, by not uh, predisposing our particular solutions or ideas on someone by wanting to help, there might be other things that are possible that could help. And that would be really interesting to explore uh, a little bit more. Um, in line with that, Peter, I think it would be uh, back over to you. Same thing applies. You could answer the question you'd wish that I had asked you. Um, but in light of um, just the number of contexts, if you think of this not just being in war settings, of which there are many, but being in places where the violence is very, very high, if we look at the Global Peace Index, uh, shocking uh, levels of violence in many places that we don't really think of um, as an immediate, because they're not in the, perhaps an immediate neighborhood. But um, what does this also mean for prioritization? What does this mean for, um, for how you can get mental health and psychosocial support uh, understood and sensitized uh, so it becomes a component of how the EU works in a number of its external policies. I mean, surely peace is not just for, for your division and colleagues, and peace is an issue for everybody. Yes, and I think one of the elements of the answers I already gave, we are trying to work on this kind of a guide to really make it among all colleagues known, because we're the colleagues for the first intervention early on, but what we are working on, a big part of it, is to make it known to make others aware of the importance and build in already long-term financing, which then others are in charge of, that they, are, that they know they're not coming and everything is behind us and something else starting. No, this is something that has to start. So work on this toolbox is, 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 is a first uh, very important element in it. Then prioritization, yes, we always have to prioritize, um, but uh, we're definitely, notably on this work, not Eurocentric. Uh, we are doing a lot of it in Africa. We've been in Colombia for decades um, and in other parts of the world. But what you also need is, in addition to this being local, I think you also have to be very creative. I think you should really allow, and that's where we are still in, I indicated some of that already, we work in some context with artists, we work with people who produce murals, yeah. with people who have dance, music, whatever kind of art elements. A lot is communities, I mentioned it, also the economic dimension might then be an important element, but it is this kind of, let's, we still have to be very creative, there is not the simple thing that we can roll out, um, and there are many creative people, and as I said earlier on, that's also why we are here to see what others have as ideas and are uh, doing. Then I think there is the element of sharing it with partners, and that's again also here, because very often us as international partners in those conflicts do similar things, sometimes even competing, sometimes in a worst case contradicting, and that's also very important that we among ourselves exchange what works, what are the right packages. Wherever we come in and support a 
Truth Commission, maybe we have to, as of now, have a mental part of that package in, which until now was not uh, the issue. And for me, sorry, you, Pamela referred to that very, as very important, this caring for the caretakers. And for, there I had a very uh, emotional discussion for me because it was really touching when I uh, spoke with uh, Father Deru, who was the president of the Colombian uh, Peace, um, Truth and uh, Reconciliation Commission. And among the many impressive things he was telling me was when I said, how, how, how can you get out of this sane? I mean, he's pretty sane. He's, he's, and, and then he said, well, we didn't have anything, so what we started, and it's a bit also rituals on another end, that very early in the process he said, he has his Jesuit background, which might have helped there. 20 minutes a day, we all together do a bit of a meditation. You ever do what fits for you, but we have this ritual, we have this element. And that was also when we started thinking that we need this work strength as well. Where, how can we work with our own colleagues, with those who are in the field? Because very often the peacekeepers, etc., they also have to be looked after. So the field is wide, and yes, prioritization at the end, but for the time being, let's still also experiment and, and, and keep that field open. I love how you mentioned the creativity and that side of it. Wouldn't it be wonderful at next year's uh, Basel Peace Forum if we got to see uh, an artistic uh, paintings and drawings and, and perhaps some displays of some of these things that, are, that have taken place in the area of trauma healing as a follow-on from this year's uh, forum. I but never sign spontaneously on the stage anything. Oh, <laughs> you never know. But I take it with me. Um, but yeah, no, that would be wonderful to see some of that and, and pleased to see you uh, bring that into it. In, in terms of Pamela, one of the things that in putting this panel together and thinking about the issue, it's a really large issue and it's seen from a number of different silos. And in a way, uh, to be more effective on this, we're going to have to break through those. And in some ways, we're forced to because we're all working in different areas a little bit on top of each other. And it's not so clean as our disciplines might have us uh, say. But could you maybe say a little bit more about how to bridge the gap between the medical world and other practitioners? You come from the medical world um, yourself, but I'd love to hear about some of your experiences there. Yes, I think that the most important thing is to know that anyone can come face to face with a victim or with someone that has had uh, difficult experiences, as you were saying, it's not maybe the first person will be a psychologist necessarily, but a lawyer, uh, a community member, or any other uh, professional that is working on, on any of these issues. So I think that this kind of this toolbox would be very useful on how to, to react, on how to, to connect in that moment with this person that is opening up and also how to take care of ourselves. Because uh, I think that uh, it's very important to know that anyone can be affected by what, what, they, what they are hearing, another experience, even if it, it's not exactly mine, or it may be similar to mine, or none at all. But we are humans and we, we, we empathize with, with the pain of this other person. I think that uh, to bridge the gap, it would be very important to sensibilize uh, all these actors that are uh, working within this context, difficult context or context that are uh, uh, with this violent uh, dynamics. Uh, it would be important to have like, uh, some first ideas of what is psychosocial support of understanding uh, things ha about loss, for example, about grief, things that can also be very important in our own processes. I think that in order to take care of ourselves, I've encountered a lot like this, this guilt of feeling bad because I can see that this other person has lost their child, has lost their entire family, and that hasn't happened to me. So I believe that it's not okay for me to feel bad. 
because they have more important issues, they, they have a greater pain. So I think that that is a problem in the sense that we, we try not to face what we are feeling in that moment or afterwards too. So I think that these creative methods would be even very important for caretakers to, to do this also collective processes within the same team because some, sometimes we have the issue of the confidentiality. We cannot talk about all the cases with anyone. But as a team, if you have multidisciplinary teams, you can like conduct uh, group sessions uh, to, to cope with what you are facing. And also other methods like meditation. And I think like uh, each one is going to find their, their best method. And so I think that two main things would be sensibilization, of uh, all of the things that people that I'm working with may have encountered in their experience, in their context, and to take care also of the caretakers in order for me to be able to take care of others. So I, th I think maybe in a summary, I, I get, yeah. That's hugely helpful. Um, and I won't even try and summarize that because it was right, right on, <laughs> right, right on it. Jan from above. Um, I was actually, you know, I was going to ask you about. Um, I thought the conversation would drift more into actual, like, post-conflict situations, and so I was going to ask you about well, how do you address this in ongoing conflicts. But I don't think we really went there. You could answer that if you wanted. But I'd also be curious from your take about this issue of caring for caretakers, but practically about the work. How do we bridge the various different approaches to it? Um, you're also coming from the medical uh, side of things, but as an academic and a researcher, you've seen n numerous different sides. Maybe you could give us some insights there. Thank you. Uh, First, let me say, uh, if you are working in post-conflict areas or sometimes in rural regions, uh, it is hardly difficult to do any type of social support or even uh, trauma therapy or psychotherapy uh, or to deal or to cope with trauma. We need stability. We need orientation. We need uh, security. Uh, the place where I am working with my team in northern Iran is we are working in refugee camps with 300,000 Yazidis and 270,000 refugees from Syria. And still there's a war going on. Uh, the IS is active. Uh, the Hafsi Shabi, a Shia uh, organization supported by Iran, is doing unbelievable violence against people there. Uh, the Turkey is bombing Yazidi villages. And so far, it's very hard to work in areas where the war is going on, or at least uh, there's an instability. So uh, we are in a lucky position in Europe. If the refugee came here, at least they have a security. There's no bombing. Uh, there is no something they have uh, to fly. But in these areas, like in, in Gaza, in Ukraine, or in Iraq and Syria, it is hardly difficult so far. It's very important, as my former speakers already mentioned, we need a safe basis to sit with our patient and to talk. Just give you an example of children where uh, two or three years were in the hand of terrorists educated uh, as a child soldiers. Uh, he was five years old when he was taken by his mother, the father was killed and executed by the Danish, by the IS. When he came back to his mother, he didn't speak three months with his mother. And I asked him, do you know he, she is your mother? Yes, I know her, but she left me alone. This was his answer. She left me alone. So we see there's a kind of loss in confidence in humans and confidence in, in parents. Because uh, in, during my, uh, my work there, always children ask me why people are so evil, why they kill people. So we need answer for the children. And at least there's no important to have a special technique or to be educated. We have to win the heart of the children. They need, again, confidence 
in the world confident in person. So far, for basic psychological services, profession must be in post-conflict in a different way. But we need the security, we need the community to make some intervention new training. But also, for long term, the required personnel must be trained. And the local people must be trained to help their own people. So we have a kind of kind of perception illnesses. Some, sometimes uh, in some uh, countries uh, and groups, they don't know the psychologist. They just know the doctor. He should give him some medication and the trauma should be over. This is not possible. So we have to start on a basic to inform the people, to uh, fight against the stigmatization on psychology. Uh, no, no, not everyone likes to go to the psychologist and do a treatment. Uh, in crisis intervention and psychological services for victims of war and refugee camps, uh, it is important to have a long-term programs. And I mean not two years, three years, we not long-term. And so far, the European Commission, the European countries have to support more the NGO organization in the world to be more secure, have a lot enough money to can work with the staff and train the local person to be there. Also, for long term, on an academic way, we have to train psychologists, social workers, educators in trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder, how to deal with the people. For example, we did it in Iraq. We set up an institute for psychotherapy and psychotraumatology. And now as a fourth group, we trained like in, in Germany or in Swiss to be a psychotherapist and advanced study master. And those people are now able to train their own people. They are working in refugee camps. Uh, so uh, this is something in two ways. First, educated and trained people, the community and mental health, and also in an academic level to have more psychotherapists, to have more social workers in these countries. They can stay there. They know their own language. They know the culture. They know how to deal and how to treat with them. This is the way how we took our army. Um, I regret that we are at time. I hope this um, has been uh, very thought-provoking. I hope that it leads for all of us to find new connections to work um, more together. We, you know, healing the past, transforming the future, is about looking at how cruel humans can be, but also helping people find a way out. And I want to thank the panelists for taking the time. Join me in thanking them. And thank you to all of you.